Today, the topic of discussion is on tools and techniques of research. The focus is on qualitative research, which really is a broad generic term to cover a range of research practices. This range includes focus group discussion, oral histories, oral traditions, in-depth interviews, issues of life writings, and in the today's context, content analysis of blogs, internet, email, etc. Today, the specific focus of our topic is on focused group discussion. But before I begin the study, we would need to go into the historical justification background for qualitative research. Qualitative research grew out of the challenge to a positivist research framework. When I speak of positivist research framework, I am referring to the quantitative methods of framing your research project. The growth of the quantitative method goes back to the 19th century knowledge systems when there was an assumption based on the Descartesian model that knowledge grows out of rationality. By the 19th century, Descartesian framework of I think, therefore I am, tended to be interpreted in an empirical sense. When I use the word empiricism, I mean a look at the observed reality through the use of the senses. This framework gave a justification for a very mathematical model of social sciences because social sciences tended to adopt in the 19th century the method of sciences, pure sciences. So the theories of evolution which you see of biological evolution, etc., created by Herbert Spencer and more importantly Charles Darwin, influenced the research framework of studying social reality. By the 20th century, there was a recognition the observed reality does not necessarily indicate the sum total of human experience. The argument was the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Let me explain this very clearly. Through the use of quantitative research, you may be able to see that the use of traffic light, that all the vehicles stop when there is a traffic light, the red signal. You may also be able to get a quantitative feedback on the number of people who stop for the red light and the number of people who don't, the number of people will know the rules, etc. But what is the cultural meaning imputed by the people themselves how do they perceive the red light in the traffic signal is something that you're not likely to get. This kind of a reasoning created the ideological basis for qualitative thinking or hermeneutics as we call it. It gave rise to methodologies of philosophical ideas defined as ethnomethodology, phenomenology and the idea is the reality which we perceive is not just there. The angle of vision, the framework through which you look at that reality also influences the outcome of that examination. So it was basically a critique of a positivist objective construction of knowledge. Of course, by the time you come to the 1960s onwards, Research, as you know, also responds to uh, social reality. The 60s onwards saw a global turmoil uh, through people's movement against established statist kind of social order. You have a recognition as uh, ordinary people started getting more and more articulate, people like women, blacks, Dalits, and all the subordinated groups started asking questions. Where am I in this data set? Obviously, 
the perspective of the viewer becomes important. So two important aspects developed here. One is, as I said, the interpretive. The role of a researcher is to go beyond the objective reality to be able to interpret social reality. And the second point is what we call standpoint epistemology. Epistemology, as you will know, is the theory of knowledge. It answers a very fundamental question on how do we know what we know. It's as simple as that. There was a growing recognition that truth is multidimensional, that there isn't one truth, one unquestioned, unchallenged truth that is true for all times across historical or geopolitical boundaries. Let me put this in a little simpler way. Truth depends on the social location of the person. To give you an analogy, there is in architecture a, a, a bird's eye view and a worm's eye view. It simply means the worm sees the world differently and the bird sees the world differently. If you were in an aeroplane, you would see the world differently and if you were on the ground, you would see the world differently. So the truth becomes multidimensional and this is a very important justification for the use of qualitative methods. The social location of the viewer becomes very important. If I am a lower class person, a Dalit, a marginalized tribal woman, my view of oppression and power in society is going to be very different from if I were a, belonged to the royal family uh, and had people at my beck and call. That is why standpoint epistemology becomes important and frankly it grew out of the ideas of research developed through the new left movements. Today what we are looking at specifically is the focus group discussion. Why is it important? How do we approach focus group? What are the techniques? Right in the beginning, if you remember, I said there was a link between methodology, method and technique. Methods of research are linked to the broader framework of a research methodology. It's located in what we see as methodology. Techniques are the further subdivision of a method. Now focus group discussion is really an aim at understanding social reality from the point of view of people. It is particularly important in oral communities, people who do not have uh, access to writing and their representation through writing. Focus group discussion is extremely important in identifying community needs for policies, planning and development concerns. Now you are interested in solving the housing problem in the city of Mumbai and therefore what you would want to do is to perhaps build a luxurious building for all the slum dwellers who live in Berampada or Dharavi and shift them up there to the tar block. But you will find that people are reluctant to leave places like Berampada or Dharavi and go far away. How do you bring about the social change? There's no point wasting money by building a tar block for these people. It is more importantly to begin at their level of reality to understand why is it that the people don't want to move up a tar block? Why is it that they're comfortable living in this shacks in which they live with all the dismal conditions? Let me give you an example. Why is it that they want to live there? This is partly because Berampada is in Bandra. It's located midtown. The people who live in Berampada are largely artisans. They are daily wage workers. Moving to Wasai or beyond would mean that they have to commute a great deal. The cost of living goes up. 
Families depend on kinship and neighborhood bonds to be able to take care of their children, to give support systems in times of need. In tar blocks, people are isolated from each other. They don't get the kind of community support that they need. Therefore, how do we construct houses for the poor? Obviously, we have to give up our middle class framework and understanding that if you have a lift and a fan, people are very happy and understand what is it that improves the quality of life of these people. So people need their cultural bonds, they need their community support system, which a tar block cannot necessarily give them. And therefore, if I'm going to be a policy maker and I want a project of building houses for the poor in the city of Mumbai, I need to start at the ground level with the poor to find out what is it they want, to build consensus on the value of uh, certain sanitary conditions in which they could live. Secondly, to, I said to initiate action research. What is action research? Action research is aimed at initiating social change. Now, you may wonder why is this so? If you want to take a group of people, if you are a social worker, if you're working with the community and you want to bring about social transformation, then what you do is go beyond action research actually to do participatory action research. Uh, it comes, as I told you, from a commitment to social change and to empower people, to empower the community through which. So you don't go into the community as a boss telling them what is good for them, but rather going there, working with them and building up their consensus. Let me give you an example. Some years ago, the Research Center for Women's Studies at SNDT University was commissioned a project to do on sanitation. Now, when our researcher went into the field, she found, I know today you have the Swachh Bharat Abhyan and things like that, but, and there are instances when people are refusing to use the toilets, which is being constructed under the Swachh Bharat Abhyan. But when they went into the field, there were two or three things which came up. One is, there is a question of power within the household, because who cleans the toilet? Because the toilets can become pits of dirt and unhygienic conditions, creating a disease. More importantly, there is a socialization process itself involved, which women wanted. These women were subordinated, isolated, set away from social interactions, confined to their homes, and very often going to the toilet early in the morning with a group of women was the only time they could communicate with other women and establish female bonding. Now, how do we deal with this particular problem? Obviously, this creates a need to start with where they are and put forward the pros and cons of both systems. Get them to ask for social change, for sanitation, better facilities, create in them a certain climate and allow them and empower them through this entire process of research by bringing about change and giving the people the feeling that they are the ones creating the change. To document ongoing struggles and socio-political and economic change. How does focus group become important? All of us saw a few years back, there was a national struggle against the rape of Jyoti Singh. And there was a sudden upsurge of people questioning the state, actions, etc. Now, this was a very interesting period of history, contemporary Indian history. You are interested in documenting how did the struggle begin? Was it a social movement? Was it planned or was it spontaneous? How do you do it? One way, of course, is to look at the TV clippages and also look at documentary sources. But more importantly, is to look at the participants, 
to discuss with them, to create a, an awareness in them. How did the individual participate in the struggle? What kind of an impact it had on her? And how does she remember these stories? Now, this kind of a discussion obviously can be done with an in-depth interview. But in-depth interviews can be time consuming. It may be difficult to interview each and every one of the people. And therefore, you get a group of people together. This, in a sense, is the essence of organizing focus group discussion. So what is a focus group discussion? How do we define it? Can we? It is obviously a small group where everyone can have a chance to talk. But it needs a lot of skills. What kind of skills would we require? We must recognize these groups must be more or less similar and comfortable with each other. It should be, you cannot have a rich housewife living in a gated community sit together with a working class woman who works in a house as a domestic servant. Because in which case what's going to happen is that uh, the voices of the domestic worker, the service provider is going to be silenced. When we talk of a small group of like-minded people, it also means that more or less they, have, they are on the same social class and have a certain uh, confidence in being able to express their views. And none of the participants will be left out. So this is what I mean when I say a group has to be homogeneous. The group has to be structured around a carefully uh, predetermined set of questions usually not more than 10. Now, if you're talking of sanitation, for instance, because that's an example I gave you earlier, it can begin with around sanitation. It cannot uh, leap into something else, uh, you know, say maybe food, health, etc. Now, if these issues come by way of conversation within the group, health, the expenditures they have for health, etc., it's fine. You don't cut them short and say, okay, this is not what I want. Definitely, it's within the framework that you have set because allied issues will come in, but we need to focus on predetermined questions. My suggestion is when you have the questions together, you also do some kind of a pre-testing. This is, as you know, one of the fundamentals of the research process. When we use the word homogeneous, this is what we mean. Focus group discussion should not lead to contentious debates um, and it cannot focus on very, very complicated topics or about issues where there is divergent opinions among people. There is a, it is not a debate, it's not group therapy, something which psychologists use trying to bring about a change. Like say for instance, we could, from women's studies, we could look at say domestic violence. Now, there are certain principles of counselling which you may have learnt as a social worker. But the, the aim of a group therapy which you can have uh, may be totally different from a focus group discussion. It's not a conflict resolution mechanism either that you go to a village where there is uh, differences among people and you try to resolve that issue. That is a totally different kind of study. It's not even a study. It may be, it has a different focus. Nor is it a promotional opportunity in terms of saying, buy one, get one free. That's not what we try to do in a focus group discussion. It is definitely aimed at understanding social reality. You want to work in a village. You want to conduct focus group discussion. Perhaps the topic of your interest is self-help groups you, or maybe sanitation whatever your topic of interest but the problem is you want to know how do people view uh, sanitation in a particular village it may be a, a action research it may be just a study on cultural factors governing sanitation approaches ideas to sanitation that's a separate question altogether but the most important thing is entry point into the community 
What you need to recognize is that in a village, there are conflict situations. Very often, if you enter the village using the support of the panchayat, probably you will not get the data you're looking for from say the most marginalized, the most excluded group, because this may be a system of power and domination operating in that particular village. So the stories you want to hear, the data you want to hear will be very different from what is the ground reality. They will just turn around and say, yeah, it's all wonderful. Our village is wonderful. We have no problem. So the entry point, because you will be identified as a mole or a person who is going to spy for the panchayat leader. So the entry point is very important. Now, very often when we go into the village, we tend to make use of NGOs because we need an introduction to the person uh, over there. Now, this introduction is very important, but here too, we have to be very careful about the ideological background of the uh, person who introduced us. Why I am saying this? Because they will tend to color your data as well. I just want to give you one particular example I had when the Research Center for Women's Studies conducted a very major study in Karnataka and Gujarat on domestic violence. It was actually aimed at identifying the best practices against domestic violence. So obviously when we set up sub offices in these two states, we needed to take the help of women's groups undertake the study to identify the beneficiaries, etc. But we had to be very careful. We certainly could not go into a radical feminist group. We could not go into a very right wing group. We needed to take the help of a group which was seen centered, which would not interfere with our data sets. So the entry point for any research is very important. When I say the background of the problem, what becomes important is your review of literature. The second most important point is preparation of the discussion points. And this is where the importance of the review of literature is very important, along with the very, very clear idea of your research question. What is it that you want from the focus group discussion? That becomes a very important point. The review of literature, let me remind you once again, is not a chapter to be placed aside. It is a constant engagement with other scholars, not just to identify the limits of what scholarship has produced, but also to direct how you can conduct the research. It is equally important when you enter a community, you do not start the topic straight away. Especially when there's a class difference between you and the women you're interviewing, the first thing you should do is to minimize the hierarchy. After your introduction, you conduct certain ice-breaking exercises by which people become comfortable in talking to each and every one. And equally important, most important in research is the ethics of research, especially when you're dealing with poor people, marginalized people. We have an ethical commitment to see that we don't further marginalize them by questioning the validity of their knowledge. And the people who are part of it must be very clear on what they are giving consent to. They have a right to privacy. They have a right to know very clearly to what use the material will be used and also how their knowledge is represented. So this is where we are planning the entry point in a particular research project. We are consulting the motivators of the plan. We are telling them very clearly what we want to do with them, what is the area of topic and with their help, we are able to get together the focus group. Now, the second most important point of conducting a focus group, it cannot be in a place or time which is not convenient to the respondent. When you're working with marginalized people who are daily wage earners, 
because don't forget for them to come for your particular session they are likely to lose one day's wages you may if required give them some tea give them some nashta but definitely you're not going to give them presents and motivate them to say what you wish to say they should be very comfortable with each other and attempts should be made to break the barriers between the researcher and research this means for instance if all the women are sitting on the ground i don't go and sit on a chair and say okay now you answer me the question should be non threatening and unambiguous as i said serious political differences cannot be asked let me give you an example in one particular study a student from australia was looking at some of the health indicators in one of the rural projects that sndt university is conducting in that particular project in she was looking at conducting focus group discussions in five villages and she identified the problem for health deficiencies in one particular village was because of environmental factors but the people were not willing to comment on it because there was a power relationship between the um, organizations the factories which were polluting their river and the ordinary people they could face a life threatening situation by identifying the sources of that environmental pollution at such points of time we have to let it go we cannot force them to answer and make them feel uncomfortable and as i said earlier some tea and snacks can be served to the people as i said earlier what we have to be very careful and sensitive about is that we do not upset the schedule of people we are obviously conducting this particular focus group discussion late in the evening and Uh, because that was perhaps the only time that the participants were free to come to a, our focus group discussion having said about the informed consent we have to maintain the confidentiality uh, of the subject as i was giving you the example of that environmental pollution i owe it to my participant not to go immediately back to the polluting uh industry and tell them the i conducted a focus group discussion with these people and this is what they have to say because in that way i'm putting these people's lives under threat so confidentiality of a research subject is very important now it comes to the problem because along with collecting data we have another problem of how do we present the data now in a focus group discussion you can either record it through a video record it but audio recording has certain problems because you cannot differentiate the voices when you're transcribing the notes ideally there should be two people present there one person to moderate and continue the discussion and the other to take down discussions i needless to say that people are not comfortable in front of a camera you can't introduce the camera in that session because people are going to clam up and they are not going to talk about it. we have to be sympathetic and sensitive it doesn't mean that we impose our ideas on them there are occasions when we have to literally explain meanings to them and that becomes necessary let me give you an example the research projects that we worked at that point of time some years ago the issue of sexual harassment was introduced needed to be discussed because we were really looking at how organizations can facilitate women employees so i'm saying in many institutions we conducted this the attitude is oh in our institution there is no sexual harassment because the concept of sexual harassment itself gets mixed up with attraction between the sexes so at that point of time we have to specify what do we mean by sexual harassment and why is it different from normal human relationships the next thing is despite that if the participants do not admit to sexual harassment we have to just accept it 
I cannot impose my ideas on them. When you are conducting a focus group discussion, it is very likely that there will be changes and differences uh, of opinion. There may be digressions, but it is for us to bring the discussion back to the main topic without forcing our views on them. Now, the most difficult part of a focus group discussion is how do we analyze the data and maintaining the validity of the findings. I make a column according to, I divide the concept that I want to present, the topic I want to present, the areas I covered into key questions, key areas. Then I put the responses accordingly and look very clearly at what the people are saying as the findings. But because research also believes in transparent methodologies, that is one of the foundational principles of research itself, we cannot always present data in numbers. But the key findings that we are presenting, we can include it in the appendix along with the questionnaire, the interview schedule, etc. An important point of conducting not just focus group discussion, but is to listen to the silences. If people are not saying something, is it that they feel they are oppressed? Is it that they are feeling threatened? Or is it that it's just taken for granted? You know, as not required information. I think it's very important to maintain background and the context in which a particular idea came up. Let us not be over ambitious and assume that what the reality which came out, the words which came out at that particular focus group discussion is going to stand true for all times. Today people may say one thing, tomorrow they may change. So we need to look at what remains constant and uh, document it. The second thing is we would need to have a background of the people. It's always better to have a socio-economic background prior to the organization of the particular session. We need to discuss what kind of work women do, the participants do, are they all say part of the uh, unorganized sector, are they uh, working in garment industry. These are some background material you will need to no, as well as caste. Caste is a very, very important average income of their family. These are certain information which you need to look at. Now, in the writing of the report, we are dealing with qualitative data. It is not necessary to produce numbers, but you're dealing with such small numbers. You're dealing with the uh, focus group size of say 15 people. So numbers don't become important. But if a woman speaks of one particular very interesting anecdote that can be recorded. Let me give you a very, very simple example. Now, in this particular study, the researcher was sitting with a group of women to discuss their role, women's role in Panchayati Raj and how the members of this particular community supported other women, how much political awareness they have regarding the Panchayati Raj. These are very interesting questions you will admit. And the women said that they, were, they had helped a woman Sarpanch to be elected. But when it came to hoisting the national flag on Republic Day in the village, the men got together and said, oh, no, no, we don't want a woman cannot hoist the flag. It has to be the Upa Sarpanch, that is the assistant or whatever you call him. So now obviously the woman would have had to listen to this male voice. But fortunately the women in the village got together and said no, we will have the woman hoist the flag and resisted male domination. Would that not be an anecdote worth recording when it's reported in a focus group discussion? So be sensitive to get these kinds of stories of power, empowerment, which will add interest to your report and is worth recording. 
So another important obligation that a researcher has is to go back to the women, go back to the group and give them a feedback. Because uh, research, particularly when you're doing with marginalized communities, cannot be one of domination. You don't steal data which will help you in your career and not give them a sense of what is happening. You owe it to the people who have participated in the research to go back to them and tell them, this is what you have said and this is what I'm presenting. I do hope we are not violated your norms of privacy, etc. So feedback to the participants is a very important aspect. Now to look at the key points, I said at the beginning that uh, qualitative data uh, research practices itself emerged out of a questioning of the quantitative research techniques of the 19th century. The second important point is how theory, notions of politics and theoretical understanding of how social reality is constructed influences the choice of your method and the technique of data collection. Together they constitute what we call the research methodology. So the issues of foundations of research plus what kind of techniques of research you take are all working hand in hand with each other. Focusing in particular with the focus group discussion, we said when is it important? When does it become valuable? And what are the factors that make focus group discussion very, very successful. One is the entry point, awareness of the power relationship between the researcher and the research, as well as the dynamics in which the focus group is going to take place within a particular community. An important point that needs to be kept in research is that research should be the least intrusive in the lives of people and that research should be conducted at a period and time which is convenient to the researcher. 